up here in a minute and just to share the word of God with us. Some of you may have gotten the letter that I sent out. Uh, yeah, well, Jeremy sent it out for me, but I wrote it about just the precautions that we're taking for our health in this season. Lots of people are talking about the coronavirus. And basically our perspective is the state of Oregon has said that most of us are at low risk for it, which that sounds great. Right, and so, but we think it's a good idea to maybe take some precautions, wash your hands a little bit more often. There's lots of jokes going around about the number of people who maybe didn't wash their hands before that are now starting to pay attention to that. Be one of those people, wash your hands more often, okay? Can we agree that that's probably wise? All right, some of the ushers also, you may be seeing us maybe not shake hands quite so often or hug quite so often. That's just part of it as well. All three of my kids are at home sick this morning. They have the cold, so they're, you know, they're kids, they're fine, they're gonna bounce back. But if I don't hug you this morning, that's why. I'm just trying not to share, okay? <laughs> All right, so just, we're just something to be aware of, not something to be panicked about, not something to be freaked out. We're in the hands of God, right? He knows what he's doing, he's our healer, he's our protector. We're gonna wash our hands and pray at the same time, okay? <laughs> so, the other thing, um, on a slightly more serious note, the other thing I wanted to share with you this morning is we did, our staff and our church council met with our district leadership, Gabe and David, this last week, just to continue the conversation about where the church is going next. And I can tell you, at this point, there's no timetable that I can give you, there's no specific direction, but Gabe gave us an encouragement that I thought was really good and I wanted to share with you as a church this weekend. But he encouraged us to be taking time to fast and pray for the decision about what's coming next and where we go as a church regarding the decision of our senior pastor. And so I wanted to share that for a minute because I know that fasting is not something that we necessarily talk about a ton, but basically in essence what it is is you deciding for a period of time to go without something. Classically, it's food for a meal or a day, deciding not to eat, but it can be people fast from a lot of things. Okay, you can fast from TV or your coffee or sugar or caffeine or whatever, but it's the conscious decision to go without something for a period of time so that you can spend that time talking to God and praying and listening to him instead. And I know that for me, one of the things that fasting does is because when you go without a meal, you're really aware of how hungry you are and how much you miss food. And every time that awareness comes up for me, that's a cue. All right, yes, I'm hungry. It's time for me to go take a second and talk to God and say, God, the season that our church is in right now, we could really use your guidance. We could really use an awareness of your presence and your leading and where you're going. So my encouragement this morning over the coming weeks I'm going to be, my plan right now, we'll see how it goes, is to fast one day a week as I, as I pray. And I'm going to try and pick, my goal right now is to pick Mondays and to, to fast and pray on Mondays for this next season. I want to encourage you guys, pick something for the coming season of time. Maybe it's going without a coffee on a particular morning, or maybe it's going without one meal a day or something like that. Or maybe it's going without, you know, TV when you would have watched it or something like that. But pick something for yourself in the coming season that is going to be a regular recurring thing that is going to, when you go without it, it's going to remind you, I want to talk to God right now. I want to go to him. I want to invite his involvement. I want to ask for an awareness of his presence and his leading. Is that something as a church that we can do together? Okay, I think that that would be good and healthy as we move into this season. So I would like to invite David to come up. He is the assistant supervisor for our district of four square churches. He had a great word with us last week out of Matthew chapter 8. And so I just please welcome him this morning as he comes to share again. Oh, did I turn it on? It's, is that on? Yes. Sorry, I always find it a, a beautiful moment when I get even a little bit of technology, right? It's a glorious thing. Well, it is good to be back with you at the nine o'clock service on Spring Forward, or as we refer to it, the big 11 o'clock service Sunday. Um, isn't that awesome? It totally is. Everybody's like, even people that aren't normally the second service people become second service people on this Sunday, right? Oh, it was great. Thank you, Daniel. I, you know, I, it, was, it was great being here this week with your leaders, your council, amazing people. Um, we are continuing to pray. I love that encouragement about fasting and prayer uh, and that explanation because that's what we're doing, right? We're just seeking the Lord right now in this season of transition about what this next season looks like. And I know I mentioned it last Sunday. I'll mention it again. And we're praying for you and with you. Uh, and there's a lot of people outside of here. It's interesting. Even after I shared last Sunday, I said, you know, everywhere I go, people just, every, the first thing, how Springfield, you know, I, and I was just at another meeting with a group of pastors after last Sunday. One of the guys came up and the first thing he said is, how's Springfield doing? We're praying for them. 
And so just know people continue to do that. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to intercede and pray along with you. Uh, my wife, Sunshine, wasn't able to be here this morning with us. So I'm sorry, you only get me. So, or as we, when we go places together, I, and we introduce ourselves, I always say, I'm David, this is Sunshine. You will forever remember me as, oh, you're Sunshine's husband. And I'm cool with that. That's good. If you meet her, you're like, yeah, no, that's right. That's a good thing. Well, listen, we're going to jump in this morning. We're going to be in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, 1 through 12. Last week, we were, we were in the book of Matthew. Just a couple of weeks, you know, last week and, and today, we're talking about stories of healing. And uh, last week, we were talking about the healing of the leper, this incredible story. Uh, it's really, there's a lot of intimacy to that story of this man that is broken and hurting and gets to Jesus and finds healing. And we, we talked about all those things, and we are grateful that Jesus is our healer. And we're going to pick up today in, in Mark chapter 2, um, and it's, uh, you know, another one of the Gospels. And we're going to be talking about, you know, may have a title in there, The Healing of the Paralytic. But when you look at, you know, when you look at you, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you look at this story, you get to see a little bit of the history where Jesus was. Because when we talked last week about Jesus and the healing of, of the, the leper, he just finished the Sermon on the Mount, was coming down off of the mountain, the crowds were falling when the healing took place. Between that and this story, a lot of things take place where Jesus has finished bringing this incredible message of kingdom life and what it looks like to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus, you know, what that's going to look like, what this, this new reality is going to be. And then he steps into this ministry and he is, he is healing people. And you can see, you go on and continue to read after the leper, there's the Roman centurion servant, Peter's mother-in-law. Um, he crosses back over uh, the Sea of Galilee to uh, Gadara. You see the deliverance of the demon possessed man or men, you know, two of them. And he calms a storm and it's, it's, there's all of this that happens. And so what we have now is Jesus has crossed back over to Caesarea and he's back, or sorry, back over to Capernaum and he's back in this area where he started. And so all of this has taken place. And the only reason why I mentioned all of that is because when we pick up with this, it's pretty obvious by now that a lot of people have heard and seen what Jesus is doing. I mean, it's getting around now that these incredible and miraculous things are happening. So I want to talk today about, about healing again, right? Back in 2004, 2005-ish, I can't remember the exact date, but it was really early morning. I think it was a Monday. It was a Monday morning, uh, and I was I was actually I was actually out turkey hunting, okay, uh, out in the out in the woods. And when I got back home, uh, my wife and my daughter were gone. I, our we our kids were pretty little; they weren't in school, and. Um, one of my friends was at the house with our son, and I drove up, and I and he comes out. And he said, "Hey, uh, Sunshine had to take your daughter to the ho- your daughter to the hospital. Our daughter's name is December. Yes, Sunshine, and our daughter is December. Yep, um, yep. And so, and so I rushed up to the hospital, and and I love it because here's Legrand, and I'm in full camouflage, you know, like as I was hunting, and I just run into the hospital, and I knew all the nurses, and they're like." head on in. And so I run in and camouflage and which is great because nobody even batted an eye in the, they're like, yeah, camo. Nice. It's like the dress of choice here. And so I got back there and I'm like, what's going on? And what had happened was our daughter had woken up that morning. She was really little. And she said, mama, my legs don't work. And so, you know, sunshine tells the story. She thought, oh, you know, her legs don't work. They fell asleep. You know how your arm falls asleep sometimes when you're doing that. And I'm careful now when I use illustrations because I say things like that and I look out and realize sometimes people are like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, and then you realize, well, that wasn't relevant. But we've all had that happen, maybe. Your arm falls asleep, whatever. So Sunshine said she went in and she's like, oh, your leg must be asleep. So she got her out of bed and, and, and got her. It's like, okay, honey. And then, you know, like let her go. And she just pfft, fell over. So when I get to the hospital, I get into the, the ER and she's they have her propped up. She's sitting on the edge of this bed and the doctor that's in there awesome guy, he's checking your reflexes and there's no reflexes. And so he says, well, I'm going to put you down on the ground. I'll never forget because he put her down and he's holding her up and her legs, her legs just bent inward and they wouldn't support her. She couldn't hold herself up anymore. And so we're wondering what, what's going on. This is really strange. This is really weird. And then as the doctor looks, he said, you know, I, he goes, I think I know what this is. He goes, I think your daughter has contracted Guillain-Barre. And if you don't know what Guillain-Barre is, it's a lot of times it's, you know, you may have a virus or a cold and then 
They're not quite sure how it works, but it ends up t attacking the mylean sheath. It covers the nerves. And so it starts with paralysis. A lot of times it starts in the legs, and, but it slowly works its way north. And in extreme cases, it can, it can work its way where there's paralysis of the diaphragm. You have to go on a breathing tube. It takes a long time to recover from. So he says, look, I think she has Guillain-Barre. And we're, we didn't even know what it was. And when you look how it's spelled, it looks like Jillian something else, and you have no idea. So we're trying to figure out what go, what's going on. Well, the only thing they had to treat it, what they use this, this is called immunoglobulin. And when this took place, we had a lot of IVIG. And they have a lot of people that were serving overseas, so our military had a lot of it, and none of the hospitals had it. And when you live in La Grande, you're either going to go to the hospital right there, or you're going to go to St. Luke's in Boise, or you're going to come to Portland, OHSU. That's where you go. The only hospital that had a dose left was a child's dose in La Grande, Oregon. So we were like, well, there you go. So they hooked her up to it and they gave her the, the dosage, but it didn't do well with her and her heart started freaking out. And so I remember I was in the hospital that night with her and her heart started doing some pretty crazy things. And so the Panda team uh, from Dornbeckers, they call them the Panda team, flew in. And they picked her up and my wife in a fixed wing and headed back, and I drove. I beat them to the hospital <laughs> with wings of angels, <laughs> right? So I headed down here. So we got to OHSU, got to Dornbeckers, and that was a Saturday. That was, no, that, that, was, that had to be not a Monday. It had to be a Friday because that was Saturday. Because Saturday when we got to Dornbeckers, we got in, and, or Friday night or whatever it was, got checked in. Saturday comes, and, and she's not doing well. I mean, she's really lethargic. She can't move her legs. So, you know, as a parent, you're sitting there going helpless. So we have everybody praying. We have our whole, we have the Western United States is praying because that went out really fast. And so Saturday night comes and they're talking to us about like, okay, this is what's happening. This is how this progresses. Basically, this is what you can look forward to. So, okay. Sunday morning gets up and I call our church. I said, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. And uh, this was before our nine o'clock service. And I said, you guys, you know, just keep praying. And so nine o'clock, they're interceding. We got a whole family of people that are lifting us up in prayer. Nine o'clock service comes and goes. And uh, right, uh, that was right in the middle of the nine o'clock service, all of a sudden our daughter, December, sets up. she says, I'm hungry. And we go, awesome. Okay, you want something to eat? So we get, we're like, oh, what do you want? You can have whatever you want. I don't care. You can have donuts this morning. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want. And she starts eating, and we had scheduled for the physical therapist to come. So the physical therapist shows up um, probably about 10 o'clock in the morning, 10, 10, 15 in the morning. And he comes in, he gets her out of bed, and he takes her out. He's like, okay, honey, we're going to put you down just to see how your legs are this morning, you know, because there's this paralysis or whatever. And he puts her down on the ground, and let's go. And she takes off running down the hallway. <laughs> and I'm like... Hmm? I mean, I, I'm a man of faith, but, and it's really hard when you're like, well, yeah, I totally trust Jesus. But there was that moment of what? Like, and she just running up and down the hallways. It might've been the, the cocoa puffs and everything else I just gave her. But, but, and, and it was just this amazing moment that we all just stood there and watched. And it was just awesome because the, uh, the physical therapist, you know, they were like, well, um, it, huh, so it, yeah, this doesn't happen. So I walked, he said, excuse me. So I walked outside before our 11 o'clock service and said, so here's what you can report at the 11 a.m. service. And she was miraculously healed. And we left the hospital later that day. And they're like, well, there's really no reason you can stay. And we just, we drove home. She was just went from, I can't walk to, I can walk. And the thing I look back now, and you have lots of perspectives about healing. And I know that if we opened up a microphone, we could all tell stories of healing for the rest of the day, right? It was amazing. It was just incredible. But we had a lot of people around us that were holding us up in prayer in the midst of all of that. We were watching God do a miraculous thing. And the story I'm going to read today out of Mark chapter 2 um, is going to talk about, in a little contrast to last week, was we talked about the leper and Jesus. This is going to talk a little bit more about healing and, and how we as a community partner together in healing and how we need each other in that. So I'm going to jump in Mark 2, 1 through 12. This is what it says. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers, there was no room left, not even, a par not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat, <laughs> lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And he got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. I've made a note for myself in my notes as I was studying. Note, and this is just not, this is a freebie. I'm there, you can throw this out there. Wherever Jesus is, he gathers crowds. Je- I mean, Jesus brings people. That's just, right? People are coming to see Jesus. I love this story. This people are gathering. Jesus is teaching, and there's a, a large crowd. He's, it says that he's in this home, and, or the door's open, or he's right outside. But anyway, he's right there. There's a large crowd of people. There are those that are there that have heard what's going on. There's those that probably want to know more. There's some Pharisees, the religious leaders at the time. There's scribes, experts in the law are there, whether to hear him or try to refute him. He, they're just there. There's a, there's a large group of people there. And many of them obviously had heard not only about Jesus' teaching, but they had heard what had been happening, where Jesus had gone and the encounters that people were having and coming away from an encounter with Jesus whole and their brokenness healed and freedom and life and going from being demonized to walking in, in this amazing freedom that Jesus is bringing. So there's this group of men, there's four of them, and they must have heard about this because they have either a friend or a family member, and he's, he's they referred to as the paralyzed or paralytic. For whatever reason, he can't move. We don't know why. It doesn't say anything. It just gives us his condition. And so they come to Jesus. They get their friend on his bedding, on his mat, it's referred to, and they head to where Jesus is. No problem there. They're going to get him there. But the problem is once they get there is they can't get to Jesus. It's like coming in late to church when service is packed. All the seats at the back are taken, but lots of room up front, right? This, we refer to it as the spitting section, the anointed area, sorry, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're like, yeah, the splash zone. There you go. That's good. No, so this is, this is what's going on. They can't get to where Jesus is. So these men, and I, I just love this. This is one of these stories, I, I talked about this last week, that if you're reading and studying or journaling or whatever your personal life looks like, if you just blow through this and don't stop down, just stop to think about it for a minute, you'll, you'll miss, we just miss so much in this. Because you got a picture, four friends with their friend on a mat and they get there and they're like, Jesus is over there and there's all these people, what are we gonna do? Well, they are not deterred. So they figure, oh, let's just, I got an idea. Let's just go and get up on the roof. And so a lot of the, the, the Jewish homes at the time were flat roofed and they had like side stairs that you could access the roof. So they figure out a way to get to the stairs and get on the roof. Now, I'm just going to just process this with me for just a second. We read that like that's totally normal. When's the last time if you drove in and every parking place was taken in this, this parking lot, would you be like, I got an idea. I'm going to climb up on the roof. I need to get to worship. I'm going to dig through. I mean, that's, these guys are like, mm, okay, we need to get to Jesus, and we've got our friend, and I can't get he- through here. Let's just go around. We'll go up, and we'll get onto the flat part of the roof. So they do. They get their paralyzed friend onto the roof, and then they, one says they remove tiles. The other says they dig through. Kind of depends on what style of house it was. Don't get fixated on that. They just simply dug or removed things off of that roof to get a hole in the roof to get their friend down in front of Jesus. They dug a hole in a roof to lower their paralyzed friend down right in front of Jesus. This absolutely gets me every single time. If you think about this for a minute, can you imagine Jesus' perspective? I mean, if you're there, it's like, I'm going to tell you right now, I am not Jesus. But if I'm preaching a sermon, all of a sudden dust starts falling from the roof and little particles start, I'm going to be like, what in the world? I've often wondered what Jesus' response was at first because, I mean, there's, you know, you're tearing stuff off or digging through or removing tiles. Stuff's going to come down, right? Bits of roof. What does one say to the Savior when you interrupt his sermon by digging a hole in the roof? What's that greeting? Here you go, Jesus. You know, like, you're you're blowing your friend down. Like, here he is. I mean, there's great expectation on their part, and they are not going to be deterred. 
These men, they're audacious, they are bold, they are persevering, they're faithful, they're a little cheeky. I mean, they're, they're not going to be deterred by a crowd of people. They're getting up on the roof and they're going to dig through. They were willing to go the distance with their friend because they wanted to get him to Jesus no matter what stood in the way. Listen, healing is found in Jesus. Amen? Right? We, Jesus is our healer. But sometimes we need help to get there. And as I read this, I come away with a couple of things that just always... Number one, I need people in my life like these four guys. And number two, I want to be like one of those four guys to other people around me, right? I need people in my life like this, and I want to be like those four guys. I love when they, when they dig through and they get their friend there, Jesus applauds their faith. I love it. He says, I see your faith. And it's seen in their actions, but he also sees their hearts. Listen, just hear me on this. I, when we walk through when we walk through seasons of life, right? Good seasons, rejoicing seasons, difficult seasons, painful things, when we're dealing with things in our own life, there are times we need people to believe with us. There's times we need people to believe for us. Now, I'm not saying some vicarious faith that saves us. What I'm saying is, is I've had people stand with me when I'm saying, Lord, I'm struggling to believe. And they're like, I'll, I'll believe for you. I'm going to hold you up. I'm going to intercede for you. I'm not going to leave you alone in this. There's times I've, 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 I've been there where I'm like, all right, I'm going to believe with you. And there's times I'm like, okay, I got you in this. I'm going to hold you up. We need people who will fight for us. <laughs> my wife's mom used to say this to her at, at, when they were kids. I love my mother-in-law. We have this phenomenal relationship. She's amazing. She used to say to her daughters, I will fight hell for you and I will fight you for you. We need people in our life that will fight hell for us and will fight us for us. We need people that are willing to step into those moments and say, listen, I'm here for you. That will take us by the arm. And <laughs> we had a lady at our church in LeGrand. She is a prayer warrior. She is tenacious. She is amazing. She's incredible. And I cannot tell you how many times we had prayer teams available for prayer, and I watched her literally physically get up, go over, grab somebody, and drag them to a prayer team. I mean, she kind of knew them. If she didn't, she did by the end of that service. But, I mean, no, she was great. She would literally, she would pray, and she was very gracious, but sometimes she would go and say, hey, listen, and she knew it. Do you need prayer? Yeah. You don't want to go up there by yourself, do you? No. Okay, I'll go with you. And literally, it'd be like, I'm, I'm going to walk you up there. I cannot tell you the people that they're like, I would have never gone forward if she hadn't come up and said, can I go with you? Can I walk with you? We need people around us that will take us by the arm, who will intercede, who will pray for us, but who also stand with us. And now this requires a couple things. It requires that we see the value in others. It requires that we're willing to work at those relationships. That we realize that within church, that our relationships are not just proximal because we attend the same church or we have worship in the same building, but that we really are created as the church, Jesus, the church, the bride, that we are created to be intersecting one another on a regular basis, that I need you and you need me. Because in these moments like this, I need someone to carry me. And we've all had times where we need people to carry us, whether that's in intercession or that's standing with or those wonderful, incredible friends that are, love us enough to tell us the things that we don't like to hear. We all have those. And you can't swap them out either. I'm just telling you that right now. Listen, this man's healing took place because Jesus healed him. Absolutely. But he got to Jesus because he had some pretty passionate and edgy friends that got him there. Listen, if we don't have someone in our life that is fighting uh, for us, if we don't have somebody in our life that's willing to fight us for us, then we need to do some evaluation as to why, right? Now, look, I, I could stand up here. We could talk about rela you know, relationships for a long time, and, I, and I'm not going to do that. But I, when I say evaluate, that's not a self-evaluation. That's, Holy Spirit, would you search my heart? Because there's a lot of reasons why we don't value relationship or we don't want to step in a relationship. We can be hurt. We like to pull back. We want to be, but we need each other. And as much as you need somebody, they need you. We really do. So when we look at this, this isn't it, this is something it's like this is Holy Spirit, would you search my heart? I struggle with relationship. I struggle with stepping in because I feel like 
whatever. I won't have all the right answers. I, I don't know. I don't know anybody. You know, jump in. I learned, you know who I, I didn't have, I learned so much about relationship from a couple of friends of ours in Northern California when my wife and I were youth pastoring at this church. We had this couple, Ron and Rose Levy. They showed up at our church, and I mean, within a week, we were having dinner together. Our kids became friends. We jumped in. It was just like, go. And I, I was talking with them and realized he was a pilot in the Air Force. And we were talking. I said, I have never seen someone just jump in and just like get involved. He goes, look, my life is transient. I'll be someplace three, four, maybe five years. And then I move on. We realized we don't have time to waste being surface. So let's just do this. And I'm like, oh, that would be, that's awesome. I don't have time to be surface. Let's just jump in both feet. Why? I don't, I don't have time to waste. I learned a lot about relationship from them in that. Listen, you may be here today and what you need is someone to stand with you to believe with you, to believe for you. You might be sitting here today going, I feel alone. I need someone to stand in the gap and lift my arms like when Moses' arms was lifted in the midst of the battle. I can't hold on to this anymore. I need help. I need someone to do this. So I'm going to ask you a question, okay? And just bear with me on this one. Because I could say, hey, if you need that, would you raise your hand or whatever? But I'm not going to. If you're in this room and you're saying, hey, I'm comfortable being one of those people that stands with you, prays for you, lifts up your arms, I, I, I would be happy to, I'd be happy to bear your need to Jesus today. If you're, if you're here and you're saying, I'm really comfortable doing that, would you raise your hand? Say, yeah, I could do that. Awesome. Look around the room and see the hands. Because these are the people that you can go to. And you're like, oh, great. Now he's going to point me out. See what I mean? Like sometimes we sit there and we go, well, if you ask me, I'm not going to do that. And I knew in this room and I knew in this church getting to know you that there would be like a ton of people going, oh, I'll do it. I'll stand with you in prayer. I will hold up your arms. I'll bear you to Jesus. So when you look around, if you're in this room saying, I need someone to stand with me. Yes, at the end, there will be prayer teams up here to pray. If you guys didn't know that, you do now, <laughs> right? There, and I saw that the value of that in this life of this church for years, because we've talked about it, have, people will be available to pray. But if you don't get up here, you saw someone raise their hand. Now, listen, if you didn't raise your hand and someone comes to you and says, hey, listen, would you pray for me like that guy up front was talking about? And you're going, I don't know how to do that. Don't stress about it. Remember, it's simply this. Okay, can I pray for you? Jesus, help them. Lord, help them. Your prayers are not to the people you're praying with. So don't worry about trying to be impressive. You know what I mean? You don't have to pray to impress anybody. If it's just, Lord, help them with what they need. Your presence, your willingness are there, right? So don't, don't worry about that. I, I know sometimes people go, I just don't pray out loud. Okay. There's a first time for everything. No, okay. Listen, I, I mentioned last week, and I don't, I don't, I'm still don't know it, but I, why, I, I think at times, but why it is that sometimes pain or our brokenness makes us pull back instead of press in. And, and for whatever reason, this is where we're, we're not in this just for us, but for each other as well, right? If I'm going to be someone like these guys, it means I have to be willing to dig in and stand with even, even in the uncomfortable. Don't give up. Don't stop praying. Don't stop pursuing. Healing is not just an individual sport. Sometimes the healing comes through others standing with us and not giving up on us. Haven't you been, received healing in your life because someone else stood with you and you realized what Jesus was doing in their life and through them was healing to you? I kid you not, the longer, the more, there is a reason why the enemy's number one tactic of destruction in church is division. Because he knows together we are so much better and that we need each other. And that's why it's always about division in my own heart and my relationships with people in the church and outside the church. It's always what he does. He doesn't change the tactic because evidently it's worked for a while. So instead we go, no, 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 I see this, that we need each other. Think about this. This is amazing. I love this. And by the way, this doesn't just apply within the four walls of this church. This applies out in the world. Why? Well, come in on Sunday, hear the message, hear God's word that has been faithfully preached here for a long time. You, this, this is a congregation that has been fed so well. And then what do we do with it? We go outside these four walls. Why? Because there are people that are broken and hurting outside the four walls of the church and the community. What do they need? Somebody who's willing to go and carry them. 
And by the way, it may be that you carry them back into this place, and it may be that that doesn't happen for a while. Because did you notice something? Did you notice that the four friends wanted to get their friend to Jesus, not necessarily to a church service? Now, I love church. I'm a big fan of it. I love our family gatherings, but every place you take outside of this place where your feet step, Jesus is there because he's with you, right? So I'm going to tell you what, we need to bear one another. I want to carry you. You're going to carry me. And there are people in this community, there are people where you shop, there are people where you get gas, there are people where you live that need you to be willing to begin in prayer to lift them and carry them. And then just by your life, invite them in to see where you live and who you are. And this Jesus thing is really pretty cool because he really is that amazing, right? I used to always say, when we were in La Grande, I used to say, hey, listen, if you want to do something, if you really want to try something, try this. Next time you're going to go grocery shopping, wherever it happens to be, when you pull into the parking lot, just simply say this, Lord, if there's anybody here who needs something from you, I'm available. I said, one of two things are going to happen. A, you're going to find yourself on the aisle with all the dog food and stuff where nobody ever is because you're like, okay, I'm safe here. <laughs> Or B, you're going to end up finding somebody, and I'm not going to say that that means you're going to pray for them in public or you're going to lead them to Jesus. It may just mean that you're going to find someone that goes, I'm actually looking, and this person needs to experience a, a loving word today. They need to be encouraged today. You never know. I, I, I've had some crazy conversations with people in grocery stores. I mean, crazy. And you're sitting there going, oh, this is, that, this is Jesus. So this lifting and bearing is with one another, standing with it is in these moments, and it's also outside of this place. To travel, you know, it, this is amazing. Sometimes our perspective on the world around us is we're saying, and this does happen, and it's awesome when it does that people walk through the doors of the church and come into worship, and they've never been through the doors of a church. That's awesome. But sometimes we have to be the ones that go out because expecting people to come in is asking them to be the missionaries. I love that Patrick was up here talking about missions, and this is a church that's passionate about missions, of sending people to other countries, right? To learn language and culture to do what? Bring the message of the gospel to another, another context in a way that they understand. Just like we go out of this place with the message of the gospel and make it understandable to the world around us. Because sometimes we can slip into the mindset of we're waiting for everyone to come through the doors of the church, learn our culture, our language, how we do things, and that may not happen until we encounter people outside of here. Isn't that crazy? And by the way, as Christians, we totally can have our own entire language. I thought it was so funny. I read this article years ago. This couple that were, were not believers traveled all over the United States and they visited churches, and they had visited some Foursquare churches here in Oregon, and they were just documenting their experience of going to church and having no experience in church. Do you know what they said was the strangest thing for them? This is awesome. They said the weirdest thing for them was walking through the doors of a building and having someone meet them that they had never met before and say, can I take your kids? <laughs> They're like, I don't even know you. Hey, welcome. Can we take your kids from you? And we're going to take them to a back room. We don't know what's going on. And it was so funny because we're thinking, that's good greeting. Like, that's someone who's invested in children, right? Like, that's, that's what you do. And it was really funny to read that and go, I didn't think about that from the perspective of somebody who didn't spend their life growing up in church, walking through the door with their kids and being like, why? <laughs> oh, we have this service back here for the kids. Why? You know what I mean? And it wasn't saying that that has to change drastically. It was just funny to say, wow, I've been in church long enough that I didn't think that that would be something that's, you know, strange. Like, when we use terms, like, it's, we had sweet fellowship last night. People go, that's awesome in the church. Someone outside goes, I have no idea what you just said. Like, what were you talking about? What was, what was that? We had a great time together as friends. Oh, I get that. So you know what I mean? We, we do that. These men carried their friends to Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings healing. This is something that we get to say, Lord, I want to be someone who does that with the people around me. I want to be something that does that with the people outside of these walls. And Lord, I know that I need, I need people. And if you don't think that you need people, you need people. You do. And it's worth it, by the way. The relationship is worth it. Working at relationship is worth it. I love it what Jesus says. When Jesus says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. This is an incredible response to this man. It, it, this was awesome. It wasn't an act of just sheer will, but of faith. These men were like, okay, 
I have faith that if we, we Jesus can heal him, because we've seen this, we're, we have faith that Jesus can heal him. And it wasn't faith in their faith, right? When we talk about having faith, it's not quantitative. Like I have faith in the amount of faith that I have that Jesus, it was trust in that Jesus can do this. So they're getting this man to Jesus. And I love what an incredible response it is because when they get him there, and I'm assuming that they lowered him down there believing that Jesus' response was going to be physical healing. But I love when Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. That word son is a word that's used that has a, an idea of, of, of love and affection attached to it. And kind of like, oh, lad, you know, or oh, my, my child, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful, a beautiful interaction. Jesus is looking at this man and he's loving him. He's like, oh man, look at this. And he sees those guys. He's like, you know, these, these are men of faith. They, they believe that if they can get him here, they're looking at this guy and he loves him. And that's why he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And again, I'm assuming they're expecting physical healing, and the Lord's words are not necessarily that. He says, sons, your sins are forgiven. Now, in biblical times, the idea of forgiveness and healing were very closely tied. But that's not what Jesus is doing here. This, look, it, it may seem a little anticlimactic after they did that for Jesus to say, listen, your sins are forgiven when what they're expecting is physical healing. But I love this because it is amazing it, how Jesus did this here and how he continues to do it today that even when we're pretty sure we have figured out what we need, he will always speak to the actual issue that's going on in our life. He'll blow past what we think we need. Now, he absolutely meets those physical things because he does that here, and he still does it today, but I am, I am grateful for so many prayers that have not been answered over the years the way I thought they needed to be. I am grateful for Jesus speaking to the heart of an issue in my life rather than just the external observation of things, Right? Jesus will always speak to the real issues. I love this. I, was, I found this, this little section here, Max Lucado in his book, He Still Moves Stones. He says about this section, he goes, remarkable. Sometimes God is so touched by what he sees that he gives us what we need and not simply that for which we ask. It's a good thing too. For what, who would have thought to ask God for what he gives? Which of us would have dared to say, God, would you please hang yourself on a tool of torture as a substitution for my every mistake I have ever committed? And then have the audacity to add, and after you forgive me, could you prepare me a place in your house to live forever? And if that wasn't enough, and would you please live within me and protect me and guide me and bless me with more than I could ever deserve? Honestly, we wouldn't have the chutzpah to ask for that. We, like these friends, would have only asked for the small stuff. I love how Jesus speaks to the heart of the matter. He wasn't saying that this man was, by the way, he's not saying your sins are forgiven because of a sin, you're paralyzed. That's not what he's saying. He was speaking to the fact that this man's need for forgiveness because of the physical healing, if it was left in the physical, would only be physical. Jesus is speaking to the man to bring healing and forgiveness to the dead spiritual nature of what his life was. He's saying, I'm speaking to this fact that you need forgiveness of your sins. That's what needs to happen. He's not just physical because physical healing is amazing, but it's only physical healing. Years ago, we were in Southern California. I was on staff at a church there. We had some visiting pastors from Sri Lanka. We had a man in our congregation that was very sick. So I took one of our, the pastors. Our lead pastor said, hey, go pray for this man. So we went up, and I, 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 this was one of those moments where I was in Bible college at the time, and my theology was about to meet some great reality. It was beautiful. But we went in to pray, and I had never had someone pray like that in my entire life. We went to pray for him, and I'm thinking, you know, we pray, Lord. This guy walks in, and he looks at the man, and he lays hands on him. He's like, Jesus, come down now in this. I mean, it was with a thought. He's praying, and I'm going, I have never seen prayer like that. God did miraculous things in this guy's life, by the way, right? So we go get in the car, we're driving back to the church, and I'll never forget this, because I said to him, he said, we were talking about ministry and the life he was involved in in Sri Lanka, and he said, yeah, <laughs> he goes, yeah, the healing's the easy part. And I went, I'm sorry, what? He goes, well, yeah, he goes, Jesus says that he heals, and it's, he, he's the one who heals, so he, he brings healing. And I go, he said, the harder part is seeing someone experience forgiveness and walk with Jesus. And I said, wait a minute, are you telling me that in services in Sri Lanka, you have people that come in that are delivered and healed, but they don't accept Christ? He goes, oh, all the time. He goes, we have these services where people come in and they're broken and demonized and they're bent down and crumbly. He goes, so we take authority and deal with the demonic spirits and pray and they're miraculously healed. I said, and they literally walk out the door without receiving Christ as their savior. He goes, yeah, this happens all the time. And I'm sitting there just like, 
And he goes, but Jesus is the healer and he takes care of that. He goes, but the spiritual side of things, that needs to happen. When Jesus looked at this man and he says, listen, your sins are forgiven, he's dealing with sin nature. He's dealing with the fact of this man needs forgiveness to be spiritually new, right? He deals with the heart of the issue. Listen, we can trust to Jesus to speak to the heart of a matter within us. Be assured he's not interested in just simply slapping on a coat of paint on the outside of something. He's interested in, you know, Jesus doesn't do remodeling. He, scripture says he makes all things new. That's not a remodel. That's a demolition and a reconstruction. And by the way, that's the very nature of salvation. The nature of salvation is coming from being dead spiritually to being alive. Here's another phrase we use in church, which I just always has hit me as funny. Have you ever known someone maybe from whatever their past experience where you're like, man, that guy really got saved. You ever say that? As opposed to kind of got saved? There isn't like partial, there isn't a kind of salvation, right? When it's, it's one of those things where we'll say, man, we're saying what we're speaking to is the outward. Wow, look what Jesus did. That he's really saved. I'm like, no, coming from death to life, there's like, that's a one thing. You're either spiritually not alive or you're spiritually alive with Jesus. So there is an amazing life here. So Jesus speaking to this guy is, I see what's really going on in your life and what your heart need is, is you need your sins forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Listen, healing, there may be, and as you come for prayer, there may be physical healing and Jesus heals. May not be physical. Maybe time to open up to real life, life-giving forgiveness, the wholeness that Jesus wants to bring at a heart level. Remember we said last week that healing comes, when we come to know Christ, we're made whole and we walk in being saved, but he continues to heal us and comfort us and bring life ongoingly for the rest of our life. I love this, this last part here. He says, you know, the teachers of the law were sitting there. They're thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? I love that Jesus knows what they're processing. And he says, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. I want you to know the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I um, highlighted that last line. That's a good one to take, by the way. Just, they've never seen anything like this. It's a beautiful thing when Jesus shows up, and I'm learning, learning, not have learned, that my way of doing things or the way I think they need to be done doesn't have to be done that way especially when Jesus shows up. Because I'm thinking there's some scripture somewhere in between Genesis and Revelation where God does a lot of things his way. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I mean, it's in there. (laughs) Once again, you heard it in church. Go read the Bible. But seriously, I mean, he does it his way. And even if we came up with, and I've done it, I I have met with the Lord and I have given him my plan. The, and the audacity of our incredible, omnipotent, all-powerful, just omniscient father to say, to not consult me on his plans. It's amazing because what he has planned and how he accomplishes it are so, so far outside of how we do things. I can guarantee that when Moses was there and the parting of the Red Sea took place, that was not on his top 10 list of how God was going to deliver them. I got an idea. I know what God's going to do. Wind's going to blow all night. Water's going to be divided on both sides. We're going across. I'm sure that when he saw that, he was like, well, that's new. Like that, did, that did not come up with that. You know, first morning they went outside the tent and man is all over the ground. Knew this was going to happen. He was going to make little tiny flecks that taste like coriander all over the ground. No idea. God does it his way, incredible ways. Didn't think he could do it that way, right? I guarantee when Jesus showed up, when they were looking for a king that was going to ride in on a horse and deliver them from Rome, they were not expecting the sinless son of God to take on the form of man, empty himself of that power and hang on a cross and take upon himself the sin of all mankind. That was not anybody's plan. I love, love that the Lord does that which is not in our plans. Because people say, I haven't seen anything like that. I didn't see that coming. I had no idea, right? Listen, there's always going to be doubters and critics around that will say, you know, all things about the healing of God and, and or the work of God. 
The teachers of the law that were present accused Jesus of blasphemy because what he'd said to them was blasphemy, that only God himself can forgive sins. They missed it. Jesus knew what was going on, what they were processing, and I love his response. It's very powerful because the teachers, what they're saying is, is they think what he said is only words, that they're blasphemous because in their minds, it would have been harder for the man to be, to be you know, healed because to them, Christ's words were just cheap, that he was just spouting off. Well, you're forgiven. Well, they're thinking he doesn't have the power to forgive, so that's blasphemous and cheap. We would use the term like cheap grace, right? That's a cheap statement. He, but for them, I love this, Jesus, and I love Jesus returns it with a question. He asks them, okay, which is going to be easier here, for me to forgive this man that I love or to simply make him walk? I added the word simply in there. But for them, he shows them that his words are true and they're not cheap and the forgiveness is real and the physical healing shows afresh not only his ability but his heart towards man. His response is much like what we talked about last week and everyone is blown away. We've never seen anything like this because where Jesus is, incredible things happen and what we call the norm, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And by the way, when we talk about the miraculous, powerful working of the Holy Spirit, it's supernaturally natural. We're not talking about stylistic. We're not talking about, because I remember a lady in our church in Legrand going through our our class for membership, and we were talking about the things we believe. We were talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the prophetic. And she, I saw the look on her face. She went, oh. And I was like, okay. I said, hey, what? talk to me about that. She's like, I don't know about that whole prophetic thing. And I said, oh. Um, and, and, and her friend who brought her to the class said, oh, yeah. So when we were in service today and we were in worship, she goes, yeah. She goes, and the lady that was playing the piano started saying some things about what was going on in people's lives. She goes, yeah. And she goes, and I started crying. She goes, yeah. She goes, that's the prophetic. And she goes, oh. And I go, were you expecting like, ah! And she goes, kind of. And I go, yeah, no, that's not what we do. <laughs> so we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, the prophetic, the gifts of the Spirit. It's not stylistic, you know? When Jesus shows up, incredible things happen, but they don't have to happen in a certain way for it to be. So it's amazing. He shows up, there's incredible things that take place. And here's the thing, because where Jesus is, these incredible things happen, that is our everyday. The the church, by the way, was never meant to be a place where programming replaces the presence of God, right? It is good to have good things in place. I love that app. Like, hey, there's an app to check my kids in. I'm telling you right now, if I had had that, I would have totally messed it up, but I I, I still would have figured out how to use it. It'd be great. I love that. Technology is amazing. Those are things are fantastic. The presence of God. We don't replace the presence of God with programming. We just don't. We want good programming. We're thankful that his presence is here. Listen, where our worship, uh, you know, where we worship and lift up his name, incredible things are going to happen. Listen, Jesus, he's in our midst. He is present in us. He's working through us. And by the way, just walking out in the world around us, that work that he does as we continue to just live surrendered to Jesus, it brings people to a place where they go, I've never seen anything like this before, right? How we love and how we reach and how we live out this faith outside of this place, I've never seen anything like this before. There's this beautiful, beautiful lady in our church in Southern California. She was 80 years old. We had a huge influx of, that was back, I'm a Gen Xer, so now I'm old, but I was a Gen Xer, and we had a huge influx of young people coming into life, the church, they were getting saved and delivered, God was doing incredible things, a lot of them had different testimonies about their past. She came up to me one Sunday after church and she said, hey, Pastor David, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, she goes, I'm just struggling. She goes, I just, she goes, I don't have much of a testimony. And I said, you don't? What, what are you talking about? She goes, well, I'm 80 years old. I said, that's awesome. And she goes, I mean, I came to know Christ when I was six. And I said, okay. She goes, I just walked with him every day. She says, I got married when I was 18. We've been married for, I don't even remember how you can do the math, that long. And I was like, yeah. And she goes, we have like three or four kids. I mean, they're serving Jesus. But I go, and she's sitting there telling me this, like she has nothing to offer anyone. Because she didn't have anything, you know, like in her mind hearing these testimonies. or wasn't. I said, (laughs) I was like, I told her, I grabbed her, I'm like, you need to understand that your life with Jesus, I've got 30 young people that would want to sleep on the floor of your house to learn how to do this. They have no idea about commitment and marriage. They only see it as transient. They have no idea what it means when you say, I've just lived for Jesus every day. They have no idea about any of this. I'm like, please, I'm, 
I just want to get them to you. Because when they meet with someone like her, they're going to go, I've never seen anything like this. Because they're seeing Jesus in her life. See, that's the thing about it is, is I'm not talking about young or old or middle agers for Jesus. I have, there's nothing like that at all. I'm talking about a, a real surrendered, transformative walk with Jesus that continues every day of our life. That kind of relationship in the church, we need one another. We're connected outside of this place. People go, I have you're different. I haven't seen that before. And what they're seeing is the work of Jesus within us. And by the way, if you hear terms like evangelism or, or you know, sharing your faith and that freaks you out, just, let's just, can we just leave? Let's, sometimes we just need to lay things down in church and then not pick them up when we walk back out. Don't be intimidated by that. That just simply tells this, hey, listen, let me tell you about my life and what Jesus currently is doing in my life. If your testimony is what Jesus did 30 years ago, you need an update. This is ongoing, right? We just were like, I'm, this is what Jesus did. This is what he has done. And this is what he is doing. So people want to just see that, right? This whole Jesus thing that you're talking about, does he really, like, does he do the things that you believe? Yeah. Yeah, he does. Here's, here's my life, right? And that's a beautiful thing. Because people come away going, I've never seen anything like that. When Jesus, when people see the fruit of God's forgiveness in our life, his healing work, that is, that is a welcoming work. That is welcoming. How about you? Where, where are you today? Just God's brought you through the door. You are blessed to be up at the 9 a.m. service on Spring Ahead <laughs> Sunday. God bless you. Maybe there's healing that you need. Maybe forgiveness. Maybe change. Have you been doing the same thing the same way and getting the same results for a very long time? You ever do that? I've done that. Like, this is what I do, and this is how I do it. And then I can't figure out why there's nothing that's changing. I think the beautiful invitation from the Lord, one of the most beautiful, beautiful words in Scripture is the word repentance. It's been kind of hacked and taken over and have negative connotations. It doesn't. It's the beauty of change of direction, thinking, thought, process. Maybe healing today is, Lord, I've been doing things the same way for a long time, and I I need, I need your healing touch. I need, I need your, you to bring life and change that direction. Maybe your heart is hurting today and you need someone to stand with you and just simply say, I'm going to stand with you and lift you and bear you to Jesus today. I'm going to take you to the one who is the answer. I'll stand with you. I will pray with you. And by the way, I know the people, you know, there's the come up front. They don't stop praying for you after Sunday. It's not like they're like, oh, so you're done. They continue to intercede. The leaders here intercede. I know that. Do you need someone to stand with you today? You know, the, there was a part we were talking about earlier about bearing, you know, being willing to be people that stand with and that's inside the walls and outside the walls. Transition can be a really interesting time in the life of a church, right? You're, you're an amazing family of believers, I'll tell you that. You have incredible foundation. As you go through this transition, we talk about bearing one another's burdens and being there. Look, as you look around the people around you, step close, don't step back. Now, I've already had people ask me, what do we do, though, if we see people that step away because the transition is, is disconcerting for them? Go to them. I'm going to, here, here's the thing. By the way, that is not just the responsibility of your pastoral staff and leaders here. You have relationship. What do you mean? Maybe they want to move on. Uh, okay, if they do, but go have a cup of coffee with them. Hey, I love you. I'm thinking about you. I know transition is kind of crazy, right? But we're trusting Jesus in the midst of this, and we trust that the Jesus that has been proclaimed faithfully in this church for so long is the Jesus that's going to be proclaimed forever. But sometimes we do this. We're like, I don't know if I want to say anything because I just I don't see their faces. Go find out. Go ask. Go love them. Like, but what if they what if they don't what if they don't respond? Okay. But love them well, right? I'm not saying that. It's just something that I hear when I we in transitions. And sometimes the family that's here is, I don't know what to do with that do that. Hey, I'm going to come and be like, look, do you need me to pray for you? Do you need me to stand with you? What's, what's happening in your heart? That's an okay thing to do. It's okay thing to ask. You can do that. Knowing that Jesus is the one that you, you want, we want to know that we, we, you want to know you're loved, right? I mean, I do. 
It's okay to do that. Tell them they're loved. It's a beautiful thing to be able to do, stand with each other, right? I was just thinking about that. As I was up here, I felt like, wait, no, I want to bring that up. We'll throw that out. Stand with each other. Lift one another up. Press in, don't step back. Because Jesus is the one that brings healing. Look, I'm going to ask our... uh, our, our prayer teams to come forward. And again, I didn't say anything before, but I'm assuming there's people here that'll pray. So you guys can go ahead and make your way forward. I'm going to pray. Um, and then as we get ready to head out the door here, if you need prayer, please come forward. Um, if you're standing back there going, I knew he was going to ask people to come and, 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 uh, and do that. And I'm intimidated. Then tell someone next to you, would you go with me? And they will. And if you're that person, you will. Father, it is so good to be family. It's good to be in this place to worship you. We thank you that you are present in our midst to bring healing and life. We thank you for moments where we get to be the person that stands in the gap and lifts somebody up and bears them to you. We thank you for the moments that when we need you, that you are faithful to be there. Lord, today I would pray that there would be nothing that would hold us back from receiving what you have for us, Lord, that we would, we would be able to simply w- walk forward and boldly stay Here I am and I need you. Father, we're grateful for these moments together. We're thankful that even when we think we have things figured out, that's the way it's always been, you are bigger than that and can bring healing and life in Jesus' name. Mm. Listen, maybe God's brought you through the doors of this place today and here we are talking about Jesus and this relationship and forgiveness and all of these things and you're going, I barely know about church. I I don't know. Please hear me. There's a wide open door to move from having an understanding about God to a a personal life-giving transformative relationship with him. If you're here saying, I don't, I don't know Jesus that way. I've never experienced anything other than maybe a religious observance or kind of just a general understanding. Come forward. You can ask any one of these up here and say, listen, he was talking about knowing Jesus at a deeper level. And what does that mean? What does this whole salvation thing mean? What does it mean to be come from death to life? Because that is a wonderful step to take and be prayed for today. Mm, amen. Well, may God bless you and keep you this week. May he pour himself out on you. And may you know and walk in the forgiveness of healing of Jesus in this incredible season in front of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you love somebody? Give them a, give them a little fist bump or an elbow bump or a wave as you head out the door. If you need prayer, please come forward.